Hi, my name is Ann Sermons Gillis, and tonight I'm with Kathy Gann, and we are on the National Board of the Theosophical Order of Service. And tonight we're going to talk about what it takes to have a good Theosophical Service project. So I want to welcome you, Kathy. Thanks so much for having me, Ann. I appreciate it. So Kathy is in Denver, and I am in South Carolina, Somerville, South Carolina, a little far bit apart. And it's wonderful that we have this technology that allows us to come together and talk about the TOS and service projects. Let's get started. Let me share my screen. Thanks so much for putting together this PowerPoint. It's really very nice to have the ideas here in front of us as we discuss these, then we can keep them at top of mind. Yeah. Cool. Let's see. Well, wait a minute. Don't want to miss the, there we go. So a truly theosophical service project is one that, drum roll, arises from the viewpoint that all life is ultimately one and therefore all beings are interconnected. So uh, here we've got a couple of project actions that should develop that a little bit more. And we're starting with compassion. Tell us about compassion and how that applies to our TOS projects. This one is really, really, really important. It's fundamental to what the TOS is all about and what uh, distinguishes a theosophical project from a, I guess we could say, a less theosophical project. And that is where we're demonstrating compassion and our mindset is altruistic and the, mo the motivating emotion is positive. So for example, we would be um, doing something, uh, taking an action for the benefit of something or someone, but never against something or someone. And this was so well illustrated by uh, Jack Canfield in the movie, The Secret, he told a little story about Mother Teresa, and he said somebody once uh, invited her to an anti-war demonstration, and she said, you call me when you have a, a demonstration for peace, and I'll be there. And he said she really gets this, that you, you always want to be for something positive and not fighting against something negative, because when you fight against something, you're giving energy to it and you're maintaining it. So we always want to give energy to that which is good. We always want to become the change that we want to see in the world. So we always work toward the positive thing that we want to see. And so that does that apply? We're talking about compassion here. Um, and also we're mentioning the idea of wisdom. Um, so I think you've talked about uh, compassion and wisdom. Uh, and so um, have you had a situation in which you ever went into it and you thought this was lacking or have they always had this positive, compassionate mindset? Is it, I mean, do you have to pump it up or is it something that just arises when you decide on what the project's going to be? Within the TOS, it has always arisen quite naturally and it's never been an issue. Uh, the projects I've been involved in or heard about have always been this way, that they are positive that they show compassion and altruism and they are for something and not against. I have seen a, a very well-intended project outside of the TOS where people's hearts were in the right place. They were trying to do a good thing and they maybe didn't think it through from the standpoint of the person they were trying to help. And it ended up being a little bit uncomfortable. So this is where the, you know, the point B, the wisdom comes in really really try to apply our highest wisdom. And of course we do our best. None of us are perfect, but if we're applying the highest wisdom that we have access to, I think that's the best we can do. And just try to try to see the project from everybody's viewpoint, you know, apply the golden rule. Would, would if I were in that situation, would I want somebody to, to help me in this way? And then I think we can't go too far wrong. So that I think that probably what we're talking about here is that what separates do-gooding, which is often for the giver, as opposed to a collaboration. It's not where we stand over someone and we try to do something for them. It's where we really hold hands 
and we're all together in this and it, it benefits really everyone, the giver and the receiver. Yeah. And a lot of the points that we're going to be coming to, we'll flesh that out in greater detail. Okay. Well, let's move on then. So we're talking about synergy and teamwork. Can you mention a little bit about this and perhaps um, a, a project that you might have had that you feel like you were able to get the juices going and flowing and pe get people to cooperate? Well, pretty much all of them in the TOS, I think, uh, you know, they're all team projects. One that really surprised me, it kind of came together so well, it really surprised me how well people responded to it. Our local group here in Denver uh, usually does a project in December, and I'm talking about, you know, before COVID. We, we kept things going during COVID, but it was a little bit different. But we would always have maybe two gift drives, maybe some one thing for children and one thing for animals. And you would bring the gifts to the holiday party and then they would be delivered to the charity that we had chosen. So I think it was right before COVID, we, I was trying to think of something a little different for an animal project. And I learned about the Ironwood Pig Sanctuary about, I don't know, 40 minutes to an hour, I think north of Tucson, Arizona. And it's, it's a little bit different because you don't normally think about a sanctuary just for pigs, but a lot of people take on pigs as pets and then at some point their circumstances change or it's not quite how they thought it would be and they're no longer able to take care of the pet. Sometimes, unfortunately, people will turn a pig loose in the desert to survive on its own and they, they can't survive on their own. So this, this is a really great charity that um, goes and rescues pigs, whatever the circumstance is, takes them to this wonderful sanctuary and they create these little sub-communities, some big and some small, depending on the personality of the pig, and they put the pig in their own little neighborhood and group where they think they would do the best. In any event, that was where, uh, that was what I suggested is that we come up with blankets and comforters for the Ironwood Pig Sanctuary because they have, you know, the desert gets really cold at night, especially, especially during the winter. And so the pigs love to snuggle in these blankets and they're really clever about being able to take a blanket and with no opposable thumbs, they're able to somehow squish around and get under the comforter so that they can stay warm at night and they snuggle with each other. And it just sounded like a really fun project. And people came out of the woodwork with used blankets, new blankets, polar fleece, comforters. Uh, I had to find a very, very, very large box and just really pack things down to get that all shipped down there. So that was a fun one that, that really kind of surprised me. Yeah, and I think you told us about that on the national board. And didn't we give some funds to the to the the pigs? The yeah. pigs, you know, we hear about cats, we hear about dogs, but we don't right. hear about pigs either. <laughs> if anybody wants to help, I tell you, I saw this sanctuary on YouTube, and it was an alligator sanctuary. Oh, and there's a different the one. The same th same thing happens. People get alligators as pets. They raise them in their bathtub. They raise them in their house. They get too big. They can't survive out in the wild. And um, it was pretty amazing. They had names for all the alligators and they, they joined in a little circle around each. They had little pods and they all ate them. But it's a sanctuary that you can donate to as well. I don't think they need blankets, but there's probably something that they do need. So that's, an, uh, that's a really good idea, just not even taking everything into consideration, is that when we have our TOS projects, we can think outside the box, not just the normal things that people do. It's wonderful to give uh, clothing and so forth at Christmas or, or toys to children, but we can, if we move outside of those normal paths of giving, it's amazing what we can come up with. And I think you did come up with one. <laughs> yeah, it, it was one that, that went over really big with our group. That's right. Well, let's let's move on and see what we have now. So we're talking about really the, the moral code that we need when we're doing a TUS project. Can you speak a little to this? Yeah, this is one that, that almost should go without saying, but but we said it anyway because uh, it, it needed to be said. Needless to say, all the workers involved have to act with integrity, honesty, and dignity. And I think dignity not only in their own conduct, but also thinking about the dignity of, of everyone involved, including those being served. 
you know, again, the golden rule comes into play and we want to interact with those being served in the same way that we would want to be treated if if the roles were reversed. So certainly, you know, integrity, honesty, and dignity, you cannot have a theosophical project and call it theosophical without having these elements in place. So I think another part of this would be that it's egalitarian. As I said before, we want to walk with someone because the circumstances could be reversed and we need help. So it's not that we're helping someone because we're better than them. We know more than them. We have more than them. It's just that we're walking with people who are equal to us while they're going through a tough time and we're holding their hands or doing something that would make their life easier or better, but we're not in any way doing it because we think there's something wrong with them and we're trying to fix them. Right. And I think without doubt, at some point in our lives, we will be in some kind of a position where we need help as well. So, Absolutely. Good, good, good to see it from both sides. It is. And so here again, I think we're talking about a very similar thing, and that is to look at the effectiveness and not to look at this through our ego. We're, we're not really trying to be successful, I don't think, with these kinds of projects. What we're trying to do is to create an environment in which humanity really grows because of the light that we shine in this one area of human need. So maybe you can speak a little bit more to this number four. Yeah, we put this one in there because, you know, in theosophy so often we're told, don't seek the fruit of your actions. Don't look for the fruit of your actions. And that's kind of drilled into us in uh, theosophical literature. And it's, it's true and it's a good teaching. So this one says it is okay to look at the results that you're getting and see if your efforts are effective. Right, you know, because highly, <laughs> highly evolved people are nothing if not efficient. They are they always work in the most economical and efficient way possible in order to make their energy go as far as possible. So that's what this one is about. You go ahead and measure results to see if what you're doing is uh, having an effect it, that you wanted it to have. If it doesn't, you know, if you're if you're putting in a whole bunch of energy and getting a tiny result, maybe you could work in a different way or on a different project, put in you know a certain amount of, of effort and, and get a much bigger result. So th this is just you know kind of watching what we do, not because we're looking for something out of it or we're looking for personal gratification, not that at all, but just it's okay to measure results and and just make sure that what you're doing is is effective, and if not maybe there's some adjustments that can be made. And, you know, all projects may not be as great and grand and wonderful and effective as others. We we, we may have a, a, a few flops, and I don't think that should stop us at all. We'll just right. notice that and go on and learn. You know, we can either win or learn from these situations, or they're going to work. So there, there are no failures. They're just uh, yes. learning experiences when it comes to these projects. It, you know, we did a project in um, Houston where we would, I'm not, I'm sure you've heard about this, where you take the little baggies and you put little things like yes, for the homeless, yes, clean pair of socks and toothpaste and toothbrush and so forth. But the problem that we had was really picking them. We didn't have a way to distribute them. We put, we got all of this together and we tried to figure out how we were going to do it. And so we just said, okay, everybody take a take one, and if you live near the part where we knew a lot of homeless people are, give it, and everybody took like five backs, and we were supposed to find somebody, but now we got this whole project going on, and then we went, whoops, now what do we do? <laughs> it turned out fine, but it, it was it was just funny how we got to that point. We weren't quite sure what, what to do with them, and sometimes it, it helps to give them to other organizations. We had projects where we uh, gathered blankets for homeless people or, or unhoused people, and we're able to give this to other organizations who had, they were able to distribute these in an easy way because they were already set up to yeah. do that. So that's a very effective way of working that that is um, where you don't have to invent a wheel. And, you know, I've heard from from somebody not in the, the Houston Lodge, but uh, somebody in Washington, D.C., who was distributing similar uh, bags of, you know, 
things for homeless people, a little bottle of water, a, a granola bar, a pair, a fresh pair of socks, you know, things like that. And her experience was that not every interaction is going to be warm and fuzzy, right. but it's okay. You just, you give it anyway, and you go on your way, and you don't let that stop you. Don't let that bother you. And so that's, you know, that's one where it may look like it's not effective, but probably, probably it's doing some real good. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, when we're dealing with unhoused people, I mean, if people are they're hungry or cold or frustrated or, or depressed or stressed with life, they not may not be the most cheerful people to deal with. Right, right. Yeah, we just had a, at our church, we just had a Thanksgiving dinner and we had invited 10 homeless people. None of them showed up. And so that was this great idea. We wanted to try to share Thanksgiving. Nobody showed up. And there was a man that was at the church yard and we think he was drinking, but uh, a couple of the people went out and they invited him to come to lunch to Thanksgiving dinner. And he did come and he was crying. He was so excited and thrilled. Um, and so it didn't turn out the way we wanted. We had a certain number of people that we had invited that were going to come and none of them came. So you just, you never know. It's like we say with a, with a lot of theosophical programs, we say those who needed to be there were there. Yeah. And I guess it was that guy. Okay. So let's move on. Raises up those well served as well as those serving. So, um, that I think that's almost true. Any time that you give, when you're not giving to get, as you were talking about, let's not look at what the fruits are. We're not out there to eat the fruits of what we're doing. So, could you speak a little bit about this when it talks about increased awareness, connection, compassion, involvement, and capacity? Yeah, this is rather like a list of all the wonderful things that are going to happen when we get involved in service. Certainly, we want our projects to be such that they will raise up those being served, but you can't help but be raised and uplifted by that interaction yourself. You just, you can't, you cannot do any kind of service without being uplifted by it, without without feeling good about it. it and it's Let's see, inspiring increased awareness. That's going to be increased awareness on both sides, those serving and those being served. Perhaps even more so those serving, because this is a wonderful way to get to know ourselves. And that's kind of at the heart of spiritual growth is getting to know yourself. Boy, there is nothing like a service project to get to know yourself. Absolutely. So that's, that's increased awareness and also increased awareness of people whose circumstances and lifestyles are very different from your own. Their viewpoints are different. Their culture may be different. And so you're increasing your awareness in that way. Connection. Uh, this is a great one. And I think more so that's going to take place when you're um, when you're face to face and having in-person contact with those being served. The, the example that comes to mind is the Wheaton Action Group in Wheaton, Illinois, by our national headquarters. Um, some of the people, at least before COVID, would go over to a local food pantry and they would take turns or they would take a shift where they would help customers at the food pantry go around and help them with their shopping, help them to make balanced and healthy food choices. And that's just a wonderful example of, you know, one-on-one -on -one contact. Can you imagine there certainly would be a connection made? Yeah. A very friendly, kind, compassionate, but just just a warm, happy connection. And, uh, you know, the, the involvement, um, th this is what we're talking about, getting involved and increasing your awareness. And it also increases our capacity. The more service projects we do, the more we have the capacity to do. Yeah, I think that might have been easier, helping people that were coming to get food than the TOS project that I was involved in, in which we went and we helped at the food pantry. And I think, you know, we had these 100 pound bags of rice that we had to deal with and fill them up. But what was really wonderful is that after we did the rice and the canned goods and all those things, then we were told how many meals we had created for people. And it was something like 1600 meals in that you're going, oh my gosh, 1600 meals for the people in Houston. That's absolutely wonderful. You hear me talking about Houston, but you know, I, I now live in South Carolina, but I, I was 
deeply involved with the Houston Lodge. Yeah, and I, re I remember your projects in Houston where you used to go to the food bank and work for a few, and just, just in a few hours, right. you, you guys had a pretty good group, like 15, 20 people. Oh, and, yeah, we had T-shirts and everything. Yes, yeah, and just a few hours of work, you put together a lot of meals for a lot of people. We did. We did. I can remember, I can see some of the faces of the people that are there that are no longer with us. And uh, we just had a wonderful time together. Yeah. So, and so that was, uh, so we weren't directly in contact with the people that we were serving, but it did create a community within our group, you know, within mm -hmm. our, with our TOS members, our TS members. And I think we really felt good about it. We, so many people have this thing where it is, I have been so blessed and given so much. I want to give out, give back. I want to make a difference. And often we don't know how to do that. And if we're in the Theosophical Society, then the TOS is the place to be. If you ever have any idea that you'd like to have a project, give us a call and we'll be glad to give you some ideas. We'll probably send you over to Kathy. She's our, <laughs> she's our expert here. But that's an, another great example of the type of connection that this one is talking about, you know, connection and camaraderie among like-minded people and people in the same theosophical group. It's fun. It's fun to do these things and you feel so good and you have such a great time getting together and doing projects like you've done in Houston. I know we did one project and I came outside and it's the food bank is in the middle of nowhere and a long way from where I live and my car battery was dead. <laughs> And it was so, and and everybody was gone practically, and and it's not in the great greatest part of town, and the parking lot was empty, but there was someone that was closing up, and he had, and at the time I didn't have a AAA card, and he came over and he said, "This is not a problem." He said, "Let me just call, you know, AAA up," and AAA came, and they started. Come to find out, the battery in my Bob and my was dead, but uh, but it was like I had kind of this instant karma that I got helped immediately after I did that. It, it was a neat experience mm -hmm. to have to have this help so immediately. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's see what we've got now. Seeks viable and sustainable solutions that help maintain or restore the dignity, dignity and self-sufficiency of individuals and their communities. And I think we've touched on this a little bit. Maybe you could add to that and then offers an opportunity for transformation of the situation, environment, or people involved. Now that's a, that's a pretty big order. That is a tall order. It um, is. I know some groups refer to this as a hand up rather than a handout model, which I really like. And the example that comes to mind, and I, I think just a shining example of number six here, is what the TOS has done for years and years with the um, Lakota College of Nursing in South Dakota. It's on an Indian reservation, and uh, a scholarship has gone to a student of the nursing college who really wants to remain within the community after he or she graduates and work put their nursing skills to work there in their community to help the people out. And so you're helping the student, you're helping further that student's education, but ultimately you're helping the whole community by uh, helping, you know, uh, get highly educated medical personnel who truly want to stay and uplift their community um, from the from the medical side. So I think that's just a wonderful example of of number six. Yes, and I think another one, we can talk about the project that we, we've had in the Ukraine and some of the surrounding countries with the current war, and that is the idea that as our national organization, we have theosophists all over the world, and we have TOS members all over the world, and so when there is a crisis, we're able to send help indirectly so that they know what the viable and sustainable solutions are. We don't have to go through a lot of organizations because we've got people right there, and so we were able to take people, we were able to send money to people who were right there in the middle of the crisis, and they could see what needed to be done. I think maybe there were some people feeding animals, I think there were people locating places for people to stay, looking at possibilities of getting people jobs. And mm -hmm. so that's another example of the viable and sustainable solutions that we can help um, foster 
and serve in our country and in our world. And of course, if people would like to, and they just don't even know what to do, they can always find out that we have ongoing projects that we donate to as the national TOS. And we certainly welcome any monies that you might have that would go towards certain projects. I mean, you want to do something for the pig project, God, let us know. We'll make you, we'll make those pigs comfortable. <laughs> you can always use a few more blankies. You yeah, this, this reminds me too of when there was flooding a few years back in just horrible flooding in Louisiana. And we had a member on the ground who was affected by it, but maybe not as brutally as some of her neighbors. And we were able to quickly put together a project where we sent uh, money to her, or maybe, I don't remember if we purchased the gift cards and sent them to her or just sent her the cash and she bought the gift cards, but she was able to hand out gift cards to places like Lowe's and Target and grocery stores and just put those into hands of people who had lost literally everything. So $25 or $50 may not sound like a lot, but it'll get you a toothbrush and, you know, pajamas for your kids and just just the most basic of things. And she said the families were so happy, even just, just to get a little bit of help like that was really was really great. So yeah, uh, transformation of the situation, environment, or people involved. Uh, it is a tall order, but that's kind of the way our projects are. Yes, I was in, uh, I was in Houston, we had Hurricane Harvey and there were boats that were floating in going by my house in my front yard. We had people in, in canoes and the Houston Lodge received the monies that were collected by National. And we got quite a bit of money to help because the town of Houston was devastated. And so we helped churches. We first went to our TS individuals that were members of our lodge or, or the study groups to see if they had any needs. And then we moved out into the larger community and the members would recommend either their neighbors or their church or somebody where they needed help and we were able to distribute the money and that that was quite an exciting uh project to be a, a part of yeah and talk about transforming the situation uh, any any bit of help when you've lost everything like that is just just so great so uplifting yeah and and so i think that and not only you know, there were monies, but there there were just many, many incidences of help. I can remember in my neighborhood that were pe some people were coming into the neighborhood and they were bringing food and serving meals. And then they were serving meals to the people that were helping clean up. And it, it, it just was a time when you know, the heart was deeply touched. Yeah. There was a group in Oklahoma, I believe it was Oklahoma, <laughs> who was going to have a project where, because they were in Tornado Alley, I mean, just like right in the in the heart of Tornado Alley. And they wanted to put together a bank of uh, things like shovels and trash bags and cleaning supplies and rubber gloves, you know, things that they could deliver very, very quickly to areas where people were having to start cleaning up the sludge from, you know, a, a wind damage or water damage. And I, I thought that was a really creative solution too, something that you might not normally think about, but just to have a bank of supplies just at the ready. It's just toss them in the car and go to whatever neighborhood was affected. I thought that was a great idea. So these were organized before a crisis. Is that what you're saying? They organized yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. And I think that that is a good model. I know that before one of the hurricanes that we had in the Houston area that I went to all of the neighbors. I found out whether they would be there or not. I found out what kinds of things that each person had to offer. Did they have a saw that they could cut things down? Did they need to serve food, uh, share food? What did we need to do? And also I said that we were the crisis center. If anybody needed, they could come to our home for help. And even, and, and the hurricane did not hit as much as we thought it was going to hit, we didn't know because you, you can never tell whether the hurricane's going to hit or not. But what it did do, that very act did solidify our neighborhood. I mean, people that didn't know each other before, uh, you know, we didn't, you, are you going to be here during the hurricane? Or are you not going to be here to, during the hurricane? Do you need help? Let us know if your electricity goes out, all those kinds of things. And so preparation is a great, that's a project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, People always think, well, I need to be self-sufficient to stay safe, but really we stay safe by being in interdependent and interactive with each other. Community is so important. 
That is so powerful. We always talk, you know, do it my way and this rugged individualism, and it's just not true. Think, you know, whoever's watching this, you're probably sitting in a chair that it took a million different actions just for the chair to get there for you to sit in. We are not rugged individuals. We could, there may be a few people that survive out in the wilderness, but I've, I've talked with some people who live in the wilderness and their way of life is being encroached upon by forest deforestation and many, many things. And we are just very, very interdependent on each other, whether we recognize it or not. Yeah. So we, we better just get along. <laughs> we, we all need to get along. We need to get along. <laughs> okay. So again, I think we've been pointing in this direction all the time. And this is, you know, this is a heart thing. This is not a mind thing. And so it, the mind sees problems and the heart sees solutions. So can you speak to this? Yeah, I think when, when, a group is sitting down to think about what they'd like to do for a project. It is helpful to let it arise from the heart. And that's going to be a different answer for, for different people. And that was the beauty and the brilliance of the way Annie Besant set up the TOS from the beginning in, in 1908. She knew that the juices would flow and people would get excited and passionate about projects that were meaningful to them. So for some people, that's gonna be helping children. For some, it's it's homelessness. For some, it's stamping out hunger. You know, for some, it's animals. For some, it's the environment. And when, when something arises from the heart, you know how it feels. The, you, the, just, the inspiration flows, the juices flow, you get excited about it. Other people get excited about it. And I think it's fine if a group wants to have different projects. That's why we always offer a couple different things at the end of the year when we do our projects, maybe one thing for children and one thing for animals, because then people can kind of choose what they want to do. And most people do both. I also want to say for this, it's important not, we're not saying to put the mind aside. We still need the mind. We still need to apply the mind. It has much to offer, but if you can at least get the inspiration and the idea the impetus behind the idea from the heart, something that people are really going to feel strongly about, and then allow the mind to um, do what it does best, planning and strategizing and uh, taking care of logistics and things like that. I think that's a pretty good, pretty good combination. Yeah, the heart can't build the house. The mind's going to have to build it <laughs> if you're building a tiny house for homeless people or you're like Jimmy Carter who builds for Habitat for Humanity. And I, I love what you said about that the heart solutions are going to be different than the mind solutions. That's, that's a, a wonderful statement, really. Yeah, if it comes from our heart, we're really, we're, we're going to be into it. Okay. As we move on, we ensure the wise use of resources by conducting reasonable due diligence prior to the grant of money to or any support of another person, organization, or cause. Financial grants and or involvement occur only after reasonable assurance that the person, organization, or cause operates in consonance with the theosophical principles outlined above. Priority is given to those projects with which TSA or and or TOS members are personally knowledgeable and are involved. Yeah, this is this is how our members can feel comfortable making donations to the TOS, knowing that the board is going to be exceptionally careful and discerning, and will always we're, we're never going to send anything out blindly. We're always going to do our due diligence, or we'll find a person that we know and trust in a particular community or area before any granting or any sending of funds takes place. So you you talked earlier about Ukraine. We're personally acquainted with the head of the TS in the Ukraine. So we felt very comfortable sending funds to her. And she did a fantastic job of reporting back, just a wonderful job reporting back how they were using the money. And so that's one example. I know there was a time years ago, there was an earthquake. I can't recall where it was, but it was in a small, I want to say like a Caribbean country. Yeah, and I remember. 
And it turns out that somebody, it may have been Tim Boyd, actually, somebody knew a woman who was in charge of an orphanage. And the orphanage had been badly damaged and, and needed some funds. And so we sent some money to her. And she was able to put that money to wonderful use, taking care of the kids um, to get them through the crisis. So that's another good example. I, I mean, but with every project, it's not just a few examples here and there. 100% of our projects are carefully, carefully vetted so that money is always used as wisely as possible. Absolutely. That's important. So that that's where the mind comes in. So, yeah, this is kind of a this is kind of a mind item. Uh, this is. This is where we need to use our discernment and just be really cautious and do a lot of vetting and investigating before we, we must look before we leap is what I'm trying to say. Absolutely. Well said. So we move back into our place and space of thinking about the possibility of what we can do as a member of the TOS, a member of the TS. And hopefully what we've discussed tonight gives us some idea or ideas about constructing a project for yourself, just as one person, or for your whole lodge or your group. And even if you're not a member, don't even know about the Theosophical Society, I think these ideas will just serve any kind of organization. So do you have anything you would like to close with, Kathy? You know, I guess maybe I would encourage people to check out the TOS website, and that is theoservice.org. Maybe could you put that in the little box underneath the video when yes. you post it on YouTube? I will. I will. So theoservice.org. And just browse the articles there. You'll find some ideas for service. And as Ann said, if you, boy, if you need ideas or you just want to talk through an idea, contact your board members. We are available. We are always wanting to talk about service projects and just delighted to hear from members and, and just hear about what you're doing. We love it. Love to hear about what you're doing and, and we would love to post an article by your group. Absolutely. Yes, we would. Please send in any <laughs> articles of things that you're doing. And we take are, photos. Yes. <laughs> Yes, it's been it, 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 we've been a little bit devoid of some things because of COVID. It it yeah. shut down a lot of things, and we're opening up. And more than ever before, as each day unfolds, there are opportunities for service projects. And we hope that you will be inspired to get involved in your own service project. Thank you so much, Kathy, for being with us today, and have a great evening. Thank you, Anne. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>